Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Dr. Piers Robinson. He is co-director of the Organization for Propaganda Studies and convener of the Working Group on Syria Propaganda and Media, also working with the Berlin Group 21, which is led by the veteran diplomats Hans von Sponek and Jose Bustani, to seek accountability for the OPCW's Syria cover-up scandal. Piers Robinson, welcome back to Pushback. Good to be with you, Aaron. So both you and I have some lengthy reports up right now about the OPCW cover-up scandal, advancing the story somewhat, going into detail about just how this investigation of an alleged chemical attack in Douma, Syria was compromised. And so we thought it'd be good to give an update on our reporting, especially in the wake of this recent conference of state parties at the OPCW, where the OPCW Director General Fernando Arias who really now is the face of the cover-up. He's been covering up for the cover-up. Uh, he was just reappointed to a uh, second term. So your new lengthy study up at syriapropagandamedia.org is called The OPCW Duma Investigation, Manipulation of Key Toxicology and Related Information Regarding Alleged Victims Between the Original Interim Report and the Final Report. And this gets to a topic that I recently reported on at the Gray Zone in a multi-part series that I'm doing on the corruption of the Duma investigation about how senior OPCW officials essentially censored one of the probe's most damning findings, which is that a group of German toxicologists, expert toxicologists, they looked at footage and photos of the victims in Duma, and they ruled out chlorine gas as the cause of death. And this finding was in the original report, but it was censored. It was taken out and it was left out of the final report, a final report that claimed that there are reasonable grounds to believe that a chlorine gas attack, in fact, occurred in Duma. So essentially, in direct violation of what these toxicologists had found. So talk to us about what you looked at for your study on how this key toxicology finding was suppressed. Well, the, the toxicology issue is, is one of the four issues which was raised at the original Courage Foundation panel, uh, where an OPCW person spoke to a panel and detailed the modifications and the censorship which had occurred. And it was broken down into four areas, uh, chemistry, toxicology, ballistics, and witness testimony. And the toxicology was, was one of the key areas which was identified where there'd been indications that there'd been suppression of information. Um, as you just described, a report from, or an assessment by NATO, German NATO toxicologists had seems to have been, as it were, eliminated or, or sort of phased out of the final report. And so what I, what I did was to sort of look very systematically across the original interim report and then the secretly redacted interim report. That was a report that was, um, they tried to substitute the original interim report for something which had been essentially modified and manipulated. Um, and then the actual published interim report and the final report. And looking across these reports in a very systematic way to see exactly what was happening to the language changes uh, trying to find which bits of information were being edited out so that we could actually start the process in, in a way of, of picking up on the evidence which is now in the public domain from the Courage Foundation and from other leaked documents about this suppression of toxicology, but actually start to understand and see how this is occurring across the reports. Um, and I mean, certainly in terms of the question of what happened to the German toxicology assessment, um, it was very clear that uh, chlorine as a cause of the deaths at Duma had been ruled out, that the uh, combination of, of two key things, one was the, uh, the gathering of, of the civilians in one spot and they appear to have dropped dead on the spot, that in tandem with profuse foaming from the mouth, pulmonary edema occurring at the, at the point that, you know, as, as soon as this happened, that that was seen as inconsistent or it didn't make sense in relation to chlorine. It made sense in relation to a nerve agent, but not in relation to chlorine poisoning. And this is what the, the German NATO toxicologist concluded. And this is what was in the original interim report. Now, that effectively, by the time of um, uh, the final report, that, that clear conclusion 
that chlorine was not a cause is gone. Okay, and also that those uh, inconsistencies with chlorine, the immediate foaming, profuse foaming at the mouth from apparently pulmonary edema, and also the fact that the civilians seem to have dropped dead on the spot with no attempt to escape, those are all gone from the final report. And, and what you have left with is a, um, a sort of a somewhat carefully worded statement saying that um, toxicologists were consulted. No reference to the toxicologist consulted in June, but reference to toxicologists consulted in the autumn of, of 2019. Um, and that they concluded that they could not link the symptoms with any specific chemical. So it's essentially the clear um, conclusion offered in the original interim report confirmed by the native toxicologist that chlorine could be ruled out. It's no longer ruled out. And critically, there's no explanation of this in the final report. There's no explanation as to what the toxicologists in the autumn might have said to justify the removal of that. Um, and so one's essentially left with uh, the, the assessment that what has happened across the course of the investigation, what has happened across the course of, of the reports is that an inconvenient fact the, the dead civilians, the 43 dead civilians found at location two in Duma, um, that their deaths could not be linked to chlorine, that the symptoms that they were displaying and, and the manner in which they appeared to, to die could not be linked to chlorine. If it couldn't be linked to chlorine, then you have a very big problem with the entire claim which is made uh, in the final report that there was reasonable grounds that a chemical attack had occurred. Um, there's a sort of there's a leap of faith essentially there, which is being made, um, and it's being made on the basis of this key information from the NATO toxicologist being effectively er erased out of the final report with no explanation, no justification for that, and and that's a that, that's a key um, it, it, in a sense it's, it's it's one of the two I think key issues in relation to. Um, the Duma investigation, which really stand out as evidencing you know, distortion or manipulation of evidence, and which also gets to the very heart of the issue here, that, that there was not evidence, sufficient evidence in the final report or, or from the investigation to actually stand up the claim that was made. I mean, we can talk a little bit later about all of the, the other inconsistencies, which is part of the process of, of examining the reports then started to throw up many more inconsistencies, which you can start to identify as you go across the reports. And you can see this kind of process of cherry picking and, and, and so on, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But th this was the, the key, key sort of um, the key thing that you can find by, by looking across the reports that this has been distorted. Uh, and that evidence is being taken out and, and you're left with essentially a, a, an illogical conclusion being put forward in the final report. These civilians were not killed by chlorine gas. Then the question is raised, you know, how did they die? No nerve agents were found, which might have explained the circumstances, the foaming at the mouth, the rapid collapse, but no nerve agent was found. Uh, many questions then arise, from there, as you know full well, as to how did these people come to die? Um, and then in the broader context of Duma, you know, with uh, people who are familiar with the issue, they will know about the hospital scenes and the allegations that they were staged and BBC's Riam Delati saying that they were staged. Um, and in a sense, it opens up a can of worms. But, but staying focused on, on the Duma investigation, what, what it means is that in relation to toxicology, there appears to have been deliberate suppression of the net for NATO toxicologists and cherry picking of evidence in order to try to stand up um, the claim at the end. And of course, if you cherry picking in order to get to that conclusion, then it's not a scientific conclusion. It's a, um, in a sense, it's, it's almost a form of propaganda which is going on. So, Piers, let me uh, read for people a comparison between the original report and the final report, because it's really um, instructive just to see how the language changed and how deceptive the final report was. And let me just first explain for people, because it can be confusing. There's a lot of uh, terms and a lot of um, uh, sort of dry language in these reports. Uh, and there's very and there's a lot of different reports because there was such an extensive cover up. So let me just explain how many reports there were. There's four reports to come out of the 
OPCW, I, I Duma investigation. Only two of them were published. So you have the original report. Uh, this is the report produced by the original team. The chief author, as we've talked about on the show before, and I've reported on at the Gray Zone, was Dr. Brendan Wheelan. He is the key inspector on the mission who challenged the suppression of the investigation. So he was the chief author of that report. That report gets submitted, it gets peer reviewed, but then it gets doctored. And some se unknown senior officials add all these unsupported claims uh, to the original report, claiming there's evidence of a chlorine gas attack, pointing to Syrian government guilt without any basis. And they remove all of the, many of the inconvenient findings that the original report found that undermine the case for a chlorine gas attack because the original report found no evidence for a chemical attack in Duma at all. So you have the original report, then you have the doctored report that tried to take its place. Neither of those reports get published because when Dr. Whelan discovers the attempt to rush out this doctored report, he writes a indignant email of protest that has been published by WikiLeaks protesting just how deceptive this doctored report was. So it gets shelved. They then go back and they come out with this compromise interim report. And that's that gets published in July 2018. And basically, Dr. Whelan uh, agrees to that, uh, provided that it doesn't claim any false information. So they managed to take out some of the most damning things that were in the original report. But Dr. Whelan agrees that he'll sign off on it so long as they don't publish false information as they had tried to do with the doctor report. So then Dr. Whelan leaves the, leaves the organization in September 2018. So he is out. And then months later, in March 2019, the final report comes out. And contradicting the original report, the final report claims that there is reasonable grounds to believe that a chlorine gas attack occurred. The OPCW says that all this work was done in the months after Whelan left the organization and the months after the original team was sidelined. I've shown before how that's false based on the information available in the final report comparing it to the original report. The bulk of the investigative work was actually done in the investigation's first two months. And it appears that what happened in the last eight months of the investigation was an attempt to stall for time to make it look as if they were doing work and an attempt to come up with disingenuous language to justify or whitewash uh, excluding the original evidence uh, that was kept out of the final report. And the toxicology is a good example of that. So let me just compare what the first original report says about the toxicologist assessment when it comes to the symptoms of the victims and then how they, uh, how they treat this in the final report. So their original report says this, the rapid and in some reported cases, immediate onset of frothing described by victims is not considered consistent with exposure to chlorine-based choking or blood agents. The opinion of a number of toxicologists, specialists in chemical weapons related intoxication supported this assessment. And fast forward to the final report of March, 2019. And they say this, based on the information reviewed and with the absence of biomedical samples from the dead bodies or any autopsy records, it is not currently possible to precisely link the cause of the signs and symptoms to a specific chemical. So they're essentially saying, Piers, that it's unclear whether or not we can link the symptoms of the Duma victims to a chemical or not, that it's sort of that, that it's up in the air. Contrast that to the original report, as you talked about, where it wasn't a question of saying it's not possible. They explicitly ruled out chlorine gas, which is the same chemical that the OPCW in its final report is claiming was likely used in Duma. So it's an example there of the, the disingenuous language that they used, pretending as if it wasn't clear what was going on with the symptoms, when in fact, expert toxicologists had ruled out chlorine gas as the cause of those symptoms after looking at footage of the videos and what's uh, footage and um, and photos. And what's interesting is that the final report doesn't just censor the original toxicologist findings. It also censors the fact that these German toxicologists were consulted because they were consulted in June 2018. That's when the OPCW sent a delegation that included Dr. Whelan to Germany to meet with them. They don't include that mission, that key meeting in the final report's timeline of the mission. They do include the in the timeline meetings with other toxicologists after that, as you mentioned in, in autumn of 2018. But as you also said, they don't tell us what those toxicologists said. And if those toxicologists had contradicted 
the original toxicologist, certainly I think the final report would have said that because they could have noted that one group said this about the symptoms, but another group of toxicologists said, no, that they were wrong. They just avoid that entirely, which is another very curious omission. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. If, if the toxicologist consulted in the autumn had, had said anything to directly contradict what had been said earlier, we, we would know about it. Um, you know, given what we know about everything else would, would report in the process and, and the pressure to find a particular con- or reach a particular conclusion, we would know about it if those toxicologists had said anything which would have supported. And, and I guess one's left with, with the possible speculation, well, what were these toxicologists asked? Were they simply asked a straightforward question of, um, can you link uh, these symptoms of any chemical, yes or no? Um, and they gave their answer, well, no, and they weren't asked a specific question on chlorine. Um, that's obviously speculative, but one, one, do, one does wonder if that was the kind of approach that was taken. Because as you say, in, in your very, very accurate sort of overview of this, you, you had an incredibly inconvenient finding being delivered and confirmed by the NATO German toxicologist, ruling out chlorine. And if if chlorine was ruled out, then you don't have a cause of death and something else has happened there other than an attack. Incredibly inconvenient. And then it appears to be the drive then, as once Brendan Whelan is out of the picture, the drive then is to uh, try to deal with that problem. Um, And in in a way, and we'll sort of talk about these other areas, which you can see them modifying. Um, You know, that's the process which we seem to have with the Duma investigation, is that people who went in, they they established facts and and had a reasonably good picture of what was going on. It wasn't the conclusion that was wanted or expected. And you then have that period in the last six months, as you, as you say, where they are essentially trying to deal with the problem, deal with inconvenient facts, in, in, inconvenient evidence, in order to sort of reach a point where they can actually sort of make the claim that they ultimately make when the final report is published. Um, uh, you know, from looking across the reports, this is a, a deeply unscientific process which is going on. So one of the other things I reported at the gray zone in my first article in this new series, uh, specifically on the issue of the toxicology findings, is that when Dr. Brennan Whelan saw the final report come out in March of 2019, by this point, he's out of the organization, but he saw that the German toxicologist assessments were completely missing. And so was the fact that they were even consulted. So he wrote a letter in August 2019 to two colleagues who were with him at the meeting uh, with the German toxicologist back in June 2019. 18. And this is what he wrote to them. He said, I believe it is our professional and moral obligation to ensure the director general appreciates the gravity of the matter. There may be a justified reason for the omission, though I can't imagine what. At a minimum, a satisfactory explanation has to be provided, unquote. So he essentially was asking his colleagues to, if they were willing to join him in just informing the director general that the toxicologist assessment had been deleted and 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 omitted and memory hold in the final report. And what happened? Uh, he didn't hear back from them, but he did hear from OPCW investigators who basically uh, launched an inquiry against him for allegedly disclosing protected information. And this was a part of the inquiry that grew out of the publication of the first OPCW leak, which is the engineering assessment written by Ian Henderson, which concluded that instead of these cylinders, these gas cylinders found in Duma being dropped from the sky as the final report claimed, Ian Henderson Henderson said that it was more likely that they were manually placed on the ground, which points to this whole thing being staged. So Dr. Whelan, instead of winning over support to raise concerns about scientific fraud, found himself being investigated by the OPCW. And this resulted in his censure by the OPCW uh, and him being banned from ever working for the OPCW ever again. So that's just an example of what happens, what happened at the OPCW when someone like Dr. Whelan tries to, tried to raise his concern about scientific fraud. Instead of getting a warm reception, he found himself investigated, which is, I think, a, a very telling result. I don't know if you have anything more to comment on about the toxicology peers. If not, we can move on to other aspects of the uh, manipulation that you talk about in your new study. Well, no, I, I think I, I wouldn't make clear that 
you know, for, for, for members of the public who are trying to get their, their heads around this and, and to understand, as you said, it's very detailed. Um, but the bottom line is, is Duma location two, you had 43 civilians and people can see the pictures because they're online, uh, piled up in one spot, appearing to have collapsed on the spot with this profuse foaming from the mouth. And, and none of these things are what you would expect with chlorine poisons. What you'd expect with a nerve agent attack okay people dropping dead on the spot profuse foaming from the mouth but it's not what you'd expect with chlorine so um this is this is the kind of the, the starkness of the inconsistency of what confronted the Duma inspectors when they went in um in terms of starting to look at the material and 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 the starkness of the inconsistency which confronted the nato toxicologist looking at this evidence so this isn't as it were a subtle reading of the evidence it was relatively clear that this simply doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense in terms of chlorine and for the reasons given and, and reasons you explained in which i detail in my report taken from the original interim report it just simply doesn't make sense one of many things which simply don't make sense with the duma but this is a, obviously a standout one so another area of manipulation that you address in your report is on the feasibility of a fatal buildup of gas inside location two that apartment building where all those dead bodies were filmed um a study of this or or an analysis of this question of the feasibility that a sufficiently lethal amount of chlorine, chlorine gas or, or toxic gas could build up inside location two. That was in the original report, but it was kept out of the final report. Can you talk to us about that? Well, this is when you start to look across the reports, and of course, I start on by look, focusing on the toxicology issue, and then you start to see all these other areas where you can see that you know, problems with the, as it were, the official narrative on this. So the problems are simply sort of edited out of reports. Now, this question of the concentration of buildup of gas was that when I, when you read the report, when they're trying to evaluate what happened to these civilians, how did they all collapse on in, in one, one spot? One of the sort of logical questions to ask was how big a concentration of gas, how much could it have built up? in the stairwell where the civilians collapsed. Was it a high enough concentration, for example, to cause them to suffocate? So they might have collapsed on the spot because they, they simply couldn't breathe. Um, and there's extensive discussion of this. And really the point is made in the original interim report that it seems, you know, the question is raised how there could have been any really big buildup of gas in the stairwell. The windows were broken, for example. Um, and there would have been a continued flow of gas out and out onto uh, the street. And the other part of this is that there were reports from some witnesses, from the Country X witnesses, um, who had been organized by the White Helmets and other local actors. Country X, just to explain, is a, is a country where alleged victims of the Duma attack were taken after yeah. uh, the incident. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. we call it Country X because it has not been formally identified in OPCW documents. So that's it's referred to as Country X. Yeah, that, that's correct. So uh, and, and the other point is that some of these witnesses had reported dead bodies in the basement and there was no obvious way in which the chlorine could have gone and reached and built up a large concentration in the basement. So people wouldn't have died there in the way that was being claimed. So this is a, this is a pretty sort of odd feature confronting the investigators looking at uh, this, all of these people who were found dead. Um, in a situation where you know the question is, is begged, well, how could a concentration of gas build up sufficiently to cause them to suffocate, for example, and, and drop dead on the spot? Um, and this is spoken about at length, and the problems with the idea of um, witness claims that people were found dead in the basement, that there was no obvious route for the chlorine to go into that and to build up to large concentrations is obviously a, a pretty big question mark. Um, and to, to the lay person looking at this would be, well, how, how could this concentration build up? Um, this is simply gone. It's, it's gone as soon as you get the secretly redacted report, it's gone. And there's no indication that there was any evaluation uh, for the final report of uh, gas concentration build up. And, you know, the, 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 obviously the, the, the obvious possible high, or uh, possible um, outcome of, of, of asking that question would be there's no way you could have had a concentration of gas sufficient enough 
to cause people to drop dead from suffocation. And there's no way that that could have built up sufficiently in the basement to cause the deaths which were reported by some of the country ex-witnesses. Um, so it would have been, if it had been properly evaluated, we, we might have a good answer to that question um, as to how this gas could have built up in, in, in a way uh, to, to very large concentrations. Um, and it was obviously raised in the original report by inspectors who went in, but it's simply been um, put on the shelf um, and, you know, along with everything else that we see across these reports, probably put on the shelf because they didn't want to know what the answer to that question was um, and bringing in some kind of sort of calculation of flow dynamics and concentration buildup that it simply wouldn't have supported any idea that, that the gas would have been sufficiently concentrated to cause the people to drop dead on the spot. So it's it's a kind of it's a good example of you know a legitimate important question being raised uh, by the team in the original report, but it's you know a question which would arguably which would undermine the idea that an attack had occurred, and it's simply put to one side and, and, and not properly investigated. All right, and so since you've already said a lot about it, but anything more you want to raise about the issue of witness testimony because. As you state, there's just a huge divergence between how the original report treats the witness testimony and how the final report treats it. Whereas in the original report, there's a clear demarcation between witnesses who say uh, that there's no there was no chemical attack, and then witnesses um, who were interviewed in country X who who make a series of claims, often contradictory, about a chemical attack occurring. Yeah, I mean I, the. The, the, the toxicology issues and you start to look at the witness testimony and these things start to sort of um, uh, overlap with each other. On the question of, of the reported symptoms, you're correct. The, the, in the original report, there was a clear delineation between country X and Damasti uh, Damascus uh, witness statements uh, or witness reports. And you could see quite clearly there that the Damascus witnesses were reporting symptoms which were associated with dust and fumes, whereas um, the country X witnesses, some of the symptoms which were being reported were classic nerve agent symptoms, such as uh, constricted pupils. Okay, now, because the obvious question begged by that is, is why are country, some country X witnesses reporting nerve agent symptoms when no nerve agent was found? Now, that particular symptom, uh, I mean, it's clearly delineated in the original interim report. Come the final report, it, it, it's, it's, it's not removed entirely, but it is obfuscated and it is no longer clear that uh, constricted pupils, uh, the, the symptom of nerve agents, uh, constricted pupils was being reported by country X witnesses. That's, you, you can't tell that in, in the final report. It's in there, but they've used technical terms for it as well. So it's obscured. So the fact that you have this you know, very odd situation where witnesses in, from country X are reporting symptoms of a substance which they know was not there, a nerve agent, um, along with, as we were discussing before, the witness reports of dead bodies in the basement at location too, even though there was no way of trying to understand how there could have been the gas flowing into the basement and building up to large concentrations. Obviously, I mean, on the one hand, it highlights the problems with witness testimony and, and what they're saying, but it does start to raise questions, the, the more fundamental questions of, you know, is, is there staging going on? We, we have a, a lot of indication, obviously, now that there was staging in relation to the hospital scenes. Um, and this is clear indication of... of of, cons of legitimate concerns and questions over witness testimony and, and whether or not um, some of that information coming out is, is inaccurate um, and without going into the reasons for that, but it's inaccurate information. Um, and it's information which is going in a direction of suggesting that an attack had occurred. Um, so I, I think that, you know, these are all the kind of questions which are left hanging when you start to sort of pull out all of these details. Um, the, the other key thing that, that you see in terms of the variation across the reports, and again, this goes back to the toxicology in part, but there's questions over the authenticity of the foam-like material which is seen on some of the, of the uh, victims. And questions are raised about that in the original interim report, that it doesn't look quite right. 
for pulmonary edema foaming that it's too white and it's too the consistency is 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 too uh, sort of firm as it were um and those all those issues aren't resolved come the final report they're still in there um but not properly evaluated and another key part of what you see across reports is that um whereas in the original interim report you have a very clear identification that actually bodies were moved throughout the course of the night um in come the final report that information is is really buried into the appendices and so what you're left there with is is all, all these sort of uh, sort of pieces of information whether it's you know incorrect reports of bodies in the basement um whether it's reports of, or, or evidence or from the pictures these were being moved throughout the night um, and then questions o, o, over the phone and and there's actually an independent report by Stephen McIntyre which talks which identifies that one of the bodies which had been moved throughout the course of the night that the phone appears in a later picture and not in an earlier picture obviously builds a picture that what we're seeing at Duma is something which could well possibly be staged. All of those inconvenient bits of information, which any good detective or investigator would be really getting to the bottom of, are just, as it were, edited out or managed as you go across the reports. And then the final report sufficiently managed or edited out to allow the report to sort of at face value sort of uh, create a, a plausible claim that there are reasonable grounds there was a chemical attack using chlorine and cylinders which killed these 43 people and again um do the opcw have a good explanation for this well you know the opcw has been confronted with these questions for several years now um you know letters and communications have been sent to states parties and to un agencies um there's been a lot of time now available for clear precise answers to be given to in a sense the, the original issues raised by uh brendan whelan and, and so on um but it is is it's not been forthcoming. Everything has been sort of kicked into touch. It seems to be uh, seems to be the case. Um, and there have been no answers whatsoever. When Arias, for example, Fernando Arias, he appeared at the UN Security Council in June, and as I reported at the Gray Zone, and we talked about Arias gave a bunch of excuses, fake excuses for why he says he can't address the Duma scandal. He said it's not it's not even under his authority. He doesn't have the authority to do it, which is funny for for a head of an organization to say. He also said he can't consult with the or, with the organization's own scientific advisory board, which was the proposal of Hans von Sponek and Jose Bustani, that the OPCW go to its own scientists, its own scientific advisory board, and ask them to weigh the suppressed findings in the Duma probe and basically come to some to, to their own opinion about what happened. He said he gave a fake excuse about why he can't do that. Um, and he was asked by the Russian ambassador about the exclusion of the German toxicologists and their findings. And Arias simply didn't answer the question, which has been a, a pattern uh, so often, as you say, throughout this probe. Yeah, I mean, these are, in a sense, if you look at the Berlin Group 21 website and you look at the procedural and scientific flaws which are listed there, these are not complicated or difficult questions for the OPCW to respond to. If it has good answers, it can it can clearly explain why, for example, the original interim report was taken and modified without the knowledge of the team, and then they attempted to publish it. There can be an explanation for that. Perhaps they have a good explanation. Perhaps not. But the, these are questions which 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 you know uh, eminently possible for them to answer if they wanted to. And the fact that they're, as you say, they're not really answering any questions whatsoever or refusing to answer. And instead, in, in a way, there is a response, right? And as you said, is, is that the OPCW Director General is, is, is issuing falsehoods in the public domain and the UN Security Council meetings about Brendan Whelan and Ian Henderson. Um, and effectively also, as well as issuing falsehoods, also effectively smearing these two scientists, smearing two of its own most, most experienced uh, inspectors, scientists from the OPCW. So, so the response has been, uh, on the one hand, yes, a failure to 
answer the concrete questions which are there and which have been raised for several years now, which are not difficult questions for them to answer if, and they could do if they wanted to. Um, and then the other side of it has been essentially, you know, falsehoods and smearing of the scientists raising questions. So you have this kind of double strategy of, a, of not answering the concrete questions and then engaging in just smearing the individuals. Um, in a way, stepping back and looking at this, you just think, well, how obvious can it possibly get now for people observing this, for any objective uh, person looking at this this saga, which has gone on for two years, two, three years, to, to say, well, this is clearly, these organizations are, as, as you put it, engaging in a cover-up. In the case of Hans von Sponek and the Berlin Group 21, Hans von Sponek, a veteran UN diplomat, when he uh, wrote this letter along signed by other distinguished signatories, including Jose Bustani, the OPCW's first director general, to Arias, Hans von Sponek says that the letter was returned to sender, that Arias refused to even open up, open the letter, and he got it back returned to sender. That's the level of obstruction and disrespect that they've showed to veteran diplomats just trying to raise this issue of scientific fraud. It's pretty clear what's going on now. Um, and, and, I, and I suppose a, a, another point to raise is that, you know, they can carry on smearing people and they can carry on trying to, to damage the reputation of, of the scientists or damage the reputations of anybody who's, who's trying to support transparency um, at the OPCW. And I'm guessing they'll carry on doing that. Um, but at the end of the day, the questions won't go away. The, the facts in some way are out there in a very significant way through your work and through the leaks through the, and so on. And all of the other information which has come into the public domain, the facts are out there and they're not going to go away. Um, and until there's um, satisfactory answers, the, the situation will remain as it is. Um, they're very on smearing, but then my kind of sort of gut feeling is that the longer they carry on smearing, the, the worse they make themselves look. Um, again, you know, again, tr trying to sort of step back from this entire, um, the details of all this and just think, well, this is a pretty straightforward thing. You, you've got an organization, you've got a report that's done, and you've got some very important people within your organization raising very fundamental questions essentially were blowing the whistle on on the corruption of the scientific process you know the, the 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 sensible and the appropriate or the ethical thing to do is to take that serious just as the head of the organization would take seriously for example an allegation of sexual misconduct or anything else going on within their organization you know, you, you'd reasonably expect the head to say well okay let's get to the bottom of this and of course they haven't done that they, they, they resorted straight away to smearing and attacking um, and not answering the questions. So uh, I think history judged them very badly. Which brings me finally to uh, this new piece of news that I have in the gray zone in my latest article, the second part of the series I'm doing on the compromise, uh, corruption of science in the OPCW's probe, which is that uh, I reveal that an entire area of uh, investigative inquiry, critical to finding out how the people in Duma were actually killed, was shunned by the OPCW, and that is forensic pathology, the study of the manner and cause of death. And what I report is that basically in the early weeks of the Duma probe, the OPCW had an opportunity to consult with a forensic pathologist who could help them look at some of the observed symptoms in the Duma victims and help them try to figure out what was going on, and also help them try to figure out the time of death, which is a very critical piece of information to an investigation like this. And this opportunity was presented to Dr. Brennan Whelan, who at the time was the chief scientific coordinator of the Duma mission and the chief author of the original report that at this point in time, he was still drafting. And uh, a colleague at the OPCW offered to put him in touch with a forensic pathologists nearby in The Hague. So it wouldn't even have required going to Germany as they did with the toxicologists. And what I report is that this proposal was turned down by a senior OPCW official. Um, and I have leaked emails showing that Brendan Whelan was obviously very disappointed and said it seemed like a great opportunity, but 
the team leader said maybe later. And obviously, Whelan was disappointed in that. And then in the uh, original report that was produced, the report even specifies forensic pathology as a very important need. It talks about the need for, quote, an expert in forensic pathology to provide an authoritative assessment, unquote. And just like the toxicologist finding, this identified need, this critical gap in the investigation that the original report identifies and says needs to be filled, that gets ignored for the rest of the investigation. And the final report makes no mention of it. So, and this is speaks to you know what we're ultimately talking about here is how these people in Duma were killed. This is not just about the OPCW being compromised, although that's what the evidence shows. What it's also about is covering up of for an, covering up an investigation that was trying to find out how these people in Duma were killed. Because if the evidence showed, as the original team found, that there was not a chemical attack in Duma, and if the evidence also showed, as you've been talking about, there's ample evidence of staging, then that leaves unresolved how these people were actually murdered. And here was the OPCW in shunning forensic pathology, a very critical area. Uh, in shunning forensic pathology, basically helping to leave unexplained how these people were killed. I can't say for sure that a forensic pathologist could have helped them figure out anything substantial, but certainly by taking it off the table, by ignoring it, the OPCW left a very critical area unexplored. And I'm wondering, Piers, if you have any final comments for us as we wrap. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating finding you've got there in, in your latest report. And, and in a way, it, it just fits in with what I detail in, in my new report, which shows you, you have, you know, as with the gas concentration, for example, sort of um, obvious things which should be properly investigated. Um, you're uncomfortable that it's not going to get you the answers that you want. And so you put it to one side. This is this is not scientific. This is, this is cherry picking. It's essentially propaganda in, in a way in terms of what's going on. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's very important. And, and I think, you know, I, I was careful when I was talking about these questions of foam and, and how these people collapse on on this and so on and this question about some of the witness claims which are being made but yes you're absolutely right the bottom line is that 43 people um were found dead at location two we do not know how they were killed we know that jayesh al islam was in control of the area and we know the record of jayesh al islam and really for any every in every international body agency from the UN who are in any way tasked with questions surrounding justice and so on in the international system. This is something which should be properly investigated as a potential war crime. Getting to the bottom of how these people died, because if it, can, if it is not, if the evidence does not show that they died as a result of a chlorine gas attack, um, and as, as, as we've discussed, that certainly doesn't seem to be the case. But then the question is, how did they come to die? How did 43 um, civilians, women and children end up in that building? Where did they die? What were the circumstances of their death? We know that the bodies were being moved around. We know that there's apparently foam which doesn't really look like, doesn't look authentic uh, on them. Um, and how did they come to die? Um, one possibility, of course, is, is that they were murdered, is one possibility. Another possibility is that they were civilians who were killed in other circumstances, um, in other raids and through other means, and they were taken to that location. But this is where you end up with Duma. And this is where I think, um, I mean, for those who want to speculate, that the question, well, why have the British, French, and Americans and the OPCW been so determined in their refusal to have obvious questions answered? Well, it might be because they don't want the truth to come out, because the truth might be a very, very ugly truth. Um, which, um, as I say, is is a, a very grievous war crime, potentially. And then, of course, if that is what happened, it's there's an awful lot of questions to be answered by not only the OPCW, but also by, for example, the White Helmets, who were um, key in terms of the sort of supply of, of witnesses to the OPCW. And that can of worms get, gets opened up. 
But that's the bottom line. That's what you're left with here. You're left with uh, unexplained death of 43 civilians. Um, the narrative which is being sort of presented by the OPCW doesn't stand up. And then the questions inevitably raise as to how they died. Well, Piers, I really appreciate your time and your insight. If people want to read your latest report, it's available at syriapropagandamedia.org, and I will link to it in yeah. the notes for this segment. Dr. Piers Robinson, thank you very much. Thank you.